Hello everyone and welcome back to the YouTube video. So in today's video, what I'm going to be doing is exploring and walking through a real Microsoft code base. Now the reason I'm able to do this is because I'm working at Microsoft as a software engineer intern and I'm working on the Python extension team for Visual Studio Code. So if you don't know, within Visual Studio Code, one of the more popular editors out there right now, there's all these different extensions. And what these extensions do is just bring different functionality, different features, syntax highlighting, whatever. There's a ton of different things that come with these extensions. One of the more popular extensions is the Python extension, which you can see has been downloaded by just over 21 million people and is supported and maintained by Microsoft. Now, this is an open source extension, which means pretty much all the code that you are looking at uh, or that I'm going to be showing in this video, actually all of it is available publicly online from this repository, which I'll leave a link to in the description. So here you can see all of the code for the extension that's publicly available because it's open source. And this is what I work on every day. I work on an open source project, which means I can actually show you guys what I've done, which I think is really cool. So with that being said, I will mention that this entire code base is pretty much written in TypeScript. Uh, there is some React as well for the UI related features. And I mean, I'll be talking about that as we go through, but this is quite complicated code. It's not something that I imagine you guys will completely 100% understand, but I am still going to explain it and walk through some different features. And since the extension is so massive, I will kind of talk about, you know, some different random areas and try to give you a taste of kind of everything without going far too in depth on one specific area. All right, so we're pretty much uh, ready to get going. The last thing I'll say is actually right now there's a really awesome deal going on on a bunch of pre uh, premium programming courses. If you guys are interested in potentially purchasing a whole whack of premium programming courses, there's actually 33 of them that we have bundled together right now. I've teamed up with 26 other content creators, authors, people that are well respected kind of in the industry and as teachers, and they've taken all of their premium programming courses, and I have a premium programming course as well, and we've bundled them all together. This is usually like thousands of dollars worth of courses um, if you combine all the value of all those courses together, and we're selling it for a pretty good discount. It actually is about 94% discount. I don't want to like woo you with the big numbers. You can check out all the stuff in the description down below, but I just figured I'd make you guys aware. And this is a great way if you want to support me or support some of the other creators to get a really good deal on a ton of different premium programming courses. This is only going to be available from June 22nd to June 26th, and I believe there is an early bird discount if you purchase it on the first or second day. Anyways, I don't want to talk about it too much. There's a link in the description, and feel free to check that out and just see if it even is of interest to you. All right, so let's actually start exploring this code base, walking through some different areas, uh, and yeah, just kind of getting into it. Now, I will start by saying that this code base is massive. This is a huge code base. I wouldn't anticipate or expect anyone to be able to understand it even just in a few months of actually using it because there's so much content in here. And you'll see myself, there's some areas here that I just don't actually know what they do or I haven't been exposed to them yet. So I have a decent understanding, but I'm going to give us kind of like a high level overview of the structure of this code base. Then we'll get into some code that I've written myself that I do truly really understand and I'll talk about how that kind of works and that should hopefully give you a good idea of how we've done things inside of here and some of the design patterns and all of that. So the first thing that I'm going to do here is just kind of show you the structure. So you can see that there's a bunch of different folders here and a bunch of different random files. Now the core technology used in this code base is TypeScript. So TypeScript is the main language and what happens is when we use this extension, we compile that TypeScript code, actually transpile it into JavaScript and then run that. The reason we're using TypeScript from what I've heard is because it's way better to have a typed language when you're working on a project this large. The reason for that is that I can just hover over things, right, and see exactly what type these items are. And I can actually go and look at definitions of interfaces, of classes. I can click on, for example, like react.css properties and go, go, to, go to definition. And I can actually see all of the stuff related to that. So it's very powerful and it just makes developing and navigating a code base way easier when you have strict typing. And TypeScript is nice because it actually gives you the option to set um, typing or not. So if you're in a situation where you don't want to have strict typing, you can just not set a type for that variable or for that object or whatever it may be. Uh, and it means you can save a little bit of time, right? But for example, like for grid columns, I can see what all of these different items are. I can see if they're optional or not, and it just makes it a lot easier when you're actually doing development. 
Now, of course, you may have noticed here that we're also using React. So we use TypeScript mainly and then React as well to do all the UI related features. We also use Redux as a front end state manager and also to handle communication between the extension and between uh, the actual UI. So that leads me into the first thing that I want to say, and I want to jump into this SRC folder. So I'm not really going to talk about most of the other stuff here because it's not that important or interesting, but SRC is where all of the source code for this project is. Inside of here, we have five files, and I'll briefly define what each of these are. So client, this is where most of the stuff happens. Client is where what we call the extension lives. So because we have a user interface, we need to have some kind of front end, back end, and a separation between them. So we have the client, which we call the extension, which runs in a separate process. And then we have the data science UI, which is a user interface, which runs again in a web view in a separate process. So immediately we have two processes. What that means for anyone that knows anything about multiprocessing or multi-threading is that we have to have a very robust communication system between these processes. Because when you have two separate processes, you may have things like just sharing memory is not that easy, uh, being able to talk to one another. I can't simply just use one of the classes from another process. I need to actually send a message to that process, have that message handled have a request sent, maybe I send that with a payload, some information, some data, and then have some response sent back. So it gets very complicated very quickly. So those are the two main folders. You have IPy widgets, which is very specific to IPython widgets. If you don't know what those are, don't worry, I'm not really gonna discuss them. And then test. So inside of here is where we write all of our automated tests. Now we have a CLI on the GitHub repository, and what that does is make sure that every time you submit a new pull request, so you make some kind of change to the repository, it runs all of the tests that we've written here and make sure that they all pass. So we have unit tests, we have functional tests, I believe there's integration tests, all different kinds of tests that test pretty well every feature that we have and everything that makes sense. And you go for a pretty high code coverage, you want to really test a good majority of the code that you have in the extension to make sure that when you make a change you don't break something and something some test fails essentially right this also means that we don't have to manually test anything every time that we go ahead and make a change we can just wait for that cli on github to run and it will tell us hey you messed this up hey you need to change this add that whatever that's the point of test so anytime that we write some kind of new feature or we add or make a major change we write automated tests for that feature probably functional and unit tests um, maybe sometimes either or depends on how big or what it is and within this we actually use two different testing frameworks one of which i believe is called ts Makito, and then there's another one that is called something else was well, vs code test so i don't know what the other uh, testing framework is forget the name of it but the main one I believe is TS Makito and that essentially allows you to mock objects I'm not really gonna go into all of that because that's kind of somewhat complicated but anyways that is the main idea behind kind of how this is all set up so I could of course go into clients and go into data science UI and show you all of the different features I'm not gonna do that what I will show you though is one area that I am familiar within data science UI and kind of just talk a little bit about how that works and then I'll go over to the extension side and I'll talk about how we actually handle communication between these two processes uh, and actually one of the new features that I've been adding so let's go into interactive common here you can notice that there's a bunch of different folders and these all represent different areas of the UI the way that this works is that we actually render what's called a web view so it literally is a pretty much like kind of a mock html page uh, or yeah like a mock browser inside of vs code and that's where we render all of the react related components and all of the ui related features so if i go here to variable explorer this is something i'm quite familiar with because i've used it and i've been working on it we can see that this is react so if you look here we have a class it extends a react component it has a variable explorer props and variable explorer state now I don't really want to explain react to everyone but essentially there's two main uh, areas or two main things in everything that we call a component now what a component is is essentially something that you render within HTML so you have 
this main parent component, which is kind of like your app or your main window. And then within that, you render all of these other sub components. And the whole point of doing that is that if I make a component, for example, like a variable explorer, which lets me view a bunch of variables, I can render it in one area and then I can reuse it and render it somewhere else. So it's just a better way of writing kind of complicated HTML related uh, UIs and all those kind of things. And what you can actually do inside of these components is write JavaScript or TypeScript, TypeScript code in this case, and you can handle state of these components and properties of these components. So properties are something you pass to the component when you render it. For example, say I want, you know, the background of a component to be blue, then through the props of that component, the properties of it, I pass that I want to render it with blue, then I look at that property inside of this component and I modify the HTML accordingly. That's essentially how that works. Within each component, you also have state. So for example, say you have a height, something's resizable, that would be a state of the component. So you have a width, that would be a state. So you have the amount of time someone's clicked the button on that component. That would be a state of the component. And every time you change state in a component where you change the properties, it re-renders the component. So that's the way that this works. And this is what we use. So I don't really like that's as much of an explanation as React as I really want to give you. Uh, but this is the UI related stuff. We just used React components. And you can see, for example, here, I'm rendering a draggable component uh, that has all of this stuff inside of it. This language inside of here is called JSX. In here, it's actually TSX. I believe that stands for TypeScript something, but it's like a hybrid between TypeScript and HTML. And you can see that I can actually write, for example, you know, this inside of my HTML code. And all of my classes are not defined by class, they're defined by class name because that's what JSX uses or TSX uses as their kind of syntax for rendering HTML. So anyways, that's a whole another lesson on its own is TypeScript and all of that stuff. But essentially what happens is you have a method inside of your components called render, and that will be called automatically when any of the states or props change. And then you have lifecycle methods, which are something like should component update, component did mount that happen when certain events are triggered. So say the component just mounts, so that means it just appears on the screen. Then what you do is, well, you can kind of hook into this method and, uh, and do something. So in this case, what I'm doing is setting the initial height of the variable explorer every single time this component mounts on the screen. And mounts, actually, I don't think that means it like loads. I think that means, sorry, it means it loads. It means it hasn't rendered yet, but it loads. So I set this before it renders the initial state onto the screen. Anyways, again, not super important, but some of the examples of something that we do, the UI is fairly straightforward. It's just using React. And if you know React, then you understand pretty much the UI component. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is talk about how we actually send information between the user interface and the extension. Now the user interface you have to remember and imagine really is only responsible for rendering the UI, right? Maybe it handles things like if you press a button, uh, maybe it, you know, displays information in a nice way. But really, it's not meant to do any super computationally heavy things. It's not meant to store data persistently. It doesn't save files. It doesn't do a lot of the things that the Python extension does or needs to do. So we have to have a way for essentially the user interface to connect and interact with the extension, which has a lot of that heavy lifting or does a lot of that heavy lifting. Now, a really common example uh, is something like storing state. So here I have this variable explorer. I know I haven't showed you guys what this variable explorer is, but essentially it's just an item where you can look at the state of variables uh, in an IPython notebook. Now, when you open this thing up, you can resize it and you can change the size of it and you can toggle it so it's viewed or it's not viewed. Now, obviously, if I set it at a specific height and I close it, when I open it back up, I would expect that it stays at that height. I don't want it to automatically resize to the default height every time because then I'm just have to constantly keep resizing it, right? So a problem that I solved to start here at Microsoft was let's make that happen. Let's make it so that first of all, we can resize this variable explorer because it was not resizable before. And that if you resize it to a certain height, um, it stays at that height unless you change it, right? So the way that we do that is first of all, I'm in the UI here. So I'm in variable explorer.tsx. I'm on the, what's called not the client side, the data science UI. And well, I have this method I've called in save current height. 
that says this.props.set variable explorer height, and then I pass the height of the container and the height of the grid. This is just what the information we need to actually store the height of this variable explorer. And well, I'm calling a method that says set variable explorer height with that information. Now you don't need to know where I call this from or kind of how all the details operate, but just imagine that what we need to do here in the UI is we want to set that height. And we need to do that. We need to do that setting from the extension side because we can't set and save persistent data from the user interface. We can only do that from the extension, which is running in a separate process. So we need a way to communicate with it. So what this actually does, where this method is actually defined is inside of Redux. So Redux is what allows us to actually kind of handle state changes and communication between the extension and the user interface. Now, there's some other things that do this as well, uh, but Redux is kind of one of the core tools that we use, and I don't really want to explain too much into how Redux works, but let me just go here to variables.ts and types.ts and show you what I mean. So inside of types.ts, which is inside of the reducers folder here, what we have is actually a definition of a bunch of different messages that can be sent between the user interface and other aspects of the user interface or the extension. So for example, we have add and focus new cell. This is a message that we could send saying, hey, you know, common action type, this happened, send this to the extension, let the extension handle it over there. So essentially what we're doing is we're sending messages between the extension and the user interface. We're not, for example, like I'm not importing a class from the extension and using it. I'm sending a message and then that message will get handled on the other side. So it's a form of communication, some kind of protocol that's going on. So we define all of these messages here. I'm trying to find where the variable explorer one is. We have toggle variable explorer, first of all, that's a message that could be sent, and set variable explorer height. So that's the message that we want to send when we set the variable explorer height from the user interface. We want to send this message to the extension. So here inside of common action types, let me see if I can find set variable explorer height. So let's just control F there. And we can see that when I have common action type dot set variable explorer height, I am mapping that because this is a common action type mapping to the payload of I variable explorer height. So what this is saying is that when I use this message, I want to pass information that is inside of like that implements this interface to the extension. So essentially I need to send data with this message as a payload and the data that's going to come with this message will be I variable explorer height. Now, I variable explorer's height is a interface, and you can see that it's defined here as container height, grid height. So exactly the information that I'm sending to numbers is what I'm stating inside of here. So if we go here, that I want to send with this action. Hopefully that is clear. So once that happens, once we send the action, uh, let's go, doo -doo -doo, I got to find how all of this works now there's so many files to uh to explore let me go back to redux here so let's say that that action is sent and if i go back to variable explorer i'm just gonna have to tab back through a bunch of different things here okay so now we're in variable.ts so this file here is inside of redux it's right beside types and what this does is essentially handle when a message gets sent, what happens? So when I send a message from the user interface, so I called that method set variable explorer height from the variable explorer. Magically, I don't want to go this far, a message with common action type dot set variable explorer height gets sent. It just gets sent out through Redux and we pretty much say, hey, this is the information I want to send. Redux, take care of it. So that's what happens in the UI. So Redux says, okay, if we sent this message or if we sent this message, whatever messages are sent here, we're going to accordingly call this method. So what this is doing is pretty much mapping all of the messages that we want to handle inside of variables.ts uh, to their respective functions that are going to handle the communication. So we're still on the user interface side here. And through Redux, I send a message that says, hey, we want to set the variable explorer height with this information. Redux picks that up. It says, okay, you know, I've got this message. And then what it does is it says, I'm going to map this message to this function. So let me go to this function here, set variable explorer height. And you can see that inside of here, it's argument is a variable reducer argument that is I variable explorer height. What this means is essentially 
we're wrapping what the information that we're going to send, which is I variable explore height, and we're going to return a new I variable state. Now, this gets really confusing, but all you really have to understand here is that I grab the information out of this payload, which is what it's called. And then what I do is I post to the extension this information. So what I say now is, OK, we handle this message from Redux. OK, um, Redux has taken this. It's grabbed this information. It's going to do some kind of logic here. And then what it's going to do is send to the extension the argument, which is going to be the uh, payload here so it's going to be the data so container height and grid height with the message interactive window messages set variable explore height and then the container height and the grid height so what this is saying is let's communicate with the extension side and let's send them this information so that on the extension side we can set the variable explore height so if i go to interactive window messages dot set variable explore height let me go to references for this what i'm going to do now is bring us over to the extension where this message will be handled so essentially all of this happened on the UI and then Redux said, okay, let's talk to the extension by sending a message. So now we go to the, ex uh, let's see here, the extension. I'm trying to figure out where I want to go into interactive base. And if we look at interactive base, now we're inside the extension side. So we're in a different process. We're separated away from the UI and there's this big on message event here that happens that it pretty much says, Hey, when a mass message gets sent, handle it here and then there's all these switch cases for all the different methods that can be sent or all the different messages that can be sent one of which is set variable explorer height so essentially we say if the message that was sent was set variable explorer height call this method with the payload and ignore any errors that happen there so what we can do now is go to this method so go set variable explorer height and here this is where the logic is handled to actually store this variable explorer height so we say if payloads undefined, then the updated heights equals the payload as this interface here or this object. What we're going to do now is some fancy thing that, again, is difficult to explain and essentially store this information in local storage so that if we want to grab it in the future, we can. And in fact, right here, this variable explorer height request. And what this does is simply get the information that's stored in storage and send it back to the user interface so that the user interface can take that state and uh, and render it that, that that's what it does now i know there's there's just so much to explain here um i'm trying my best to go as thorough as i can but let's go to one more thing now so after i've just done that this communication between extension and user interface let me talk about a kind of set of features that i'm working on right now and how this works so what i'm doing actually is working on a feature to be able to export a ipython notebook into PDF, HTML, or a Python script. They already have Python script in VS Code, but there's no feature for HTML or PDF, so I've been working on that, and I can say gladly that is pretty well fully functioning. There's just a few more things we need to kind of iron out. So what I have here is this folder called export on the extension side, keep that in mind, that handles all of the exporting and actually taking a file and changing the format of that file, which is not that easy to do. So here, what I have is export manager dependency checker, export manager file opener, export manager file picker. There's a lot of different things that have to happen when you want to export a file uh, to a different format, right? And you can imagine that when I write this code, what I'm trying to do is set it up in a way that I can very easily add another format to um, export to because in the future we might want to export to something different right so i want to set up this code scalably so that it's very easy and i have a really good infrastructure if i want to add something more so i'm going to start at export manager file opener because this is the kind of entry point into this feature so any time that we want to actually export to a specific format this class will get called first and this export method will get called now, before I even get into all of this and start looking at some of this stuff, what I want to do is talk about this injection. So in this code base, we use something called dependency injection and something called inversion of control. Now, this is pretty much just a practice. It's, uh, you know, like a design pattern inside of software engineering, which allows you to have all these kind of um, services, if you want to think of them that way, that run independently as what we call singletons that you can access at any time by simply injecting them as a dependency into a class. So here you can see that what I've done is I've injected the export manager dependency checker 
as the manager into this class in its constructor. I've also injected the iDocumentManager, and this is another class that simply manages documents, right? I've implemented or injected the progress reporter, the file system, the application shell, and the browser service into this constructor. What that says is immediately when I start using Export Manager File Opener, pretty much find where these classes are, and grab them, bring them in, and reference them using these names, which means now I can use this service inside of this class. To make a class injectable, you simply define it as at injectable, and you add it into something called the service registry. Okay, so I want to show you the service registry here. What this does is simply register all of the services that we want to use in our uh, dependency injections. So whenever we have a class that we want to potentially inject into another class as a dependency, what we do is register it inside of here. And this pretty much just tells our program when we go to inject something, what we take and where we get it from. So what I've said, for example, in this export manager here, is okay, I'm going to add a singleton, which I won't really describe, uh, which is type I export manager. So it implements this interface. I can go to this interface here and you can see that all that says is that it must have an export method that takes a format and a model. So that's what this type is. We're going to call this export manager and we're going to use export manager as this class. The idea behind this is that I don't really care what class I use when I inject a dependency. I just simply refer to it using some name and then I get given the service corresponding with that. So for example, inside export manager file opener here, if I implement or I inject export manager dependency checker, I don't actually care what class implements this. I just care that it works and it does what the interface states that it does. So again, we're getting very complicated here, but the idea being that if at any point in time, I actually want to change the implementation of export manager dependency checker, all I do is change the class that this name references and nothing gets affected inside of any class that injects that dependency because it doesn't know what class it's injecting. It just knows it's injecting a class that's referenced by a name. So I know that's confusing, but that is how this works. That's how the service registry works. And this is what allows us to inject these items in here. We state them and define them in the service registry, and then we can use injection to take them into any class from any point in this extension. So that is how that works on the dependency injection. So what I do here is essentially I have, uh, this is very confusing to explain because there's a lot to go through, which I don't necessarily want to. But this just takes some export format. It takes the model, so the notebook that we actually want to export, does a bunch of stuff, has a bunch of telemetry happen, and then actually delegates all of these tasks now to the export manager file picker. So it pretty much says, okay, we've called export manager file opener. This now calls the export manager file picker. The file picker actually says, hey, we need to get you to choose where you want to save this um, exported file to. It gets it to choose that and then this now delegates to the export manager and says hey we picked that we wanted this type of file we want to save it here let's send that request over to the export manager so it can actually handle doing the export the export manager does a switch on the different formats takes the model whatever file the target that we need to save to that the export manager file picker has determined then it delegates to every specific export method so export to html is here PDF is here, which isn't done yet, and Python is here. So essentially, we have all these different classes that are responsible for very specific things. We have an export base class, which has some functionality that is shared between all of the specific export methods. And what we're doing is we're saying, okay, what we're going to need to do when we export is we need to, first of all, open the exported file, right? Once that file is exported, we're going to need to open that. So we start with the file opener because if we call this opener, if it can get an exported file from somewhere, then it can just open it, right? That's all we're doing inside of here. We're pretty much figuring out, hey, did this export happen successfully? If it did, open the exported file. Great. That's all this class needs to know and all it needs to do. Now, export manager dependency checker. Okay, well, we need to call this because we need to make sure that we have the dependencies installed on the system before we can go ahead and actually pick files and start exporting something. 
let's say this one works, right? Okay, boom, everything's working fine. Then what we need to do is go to the export manager file picker. We need to actually pick some file that we want to export to. And then from there, we need to actually export the file. So once we pick where we want to save this file, let's actually go now to export manager. So delegate the task to him. He'll take whatever we passed and then automatically say, oh, okay. So if we're doing Python, I need to do this. If we're doing HTML, I need to do this and then call one of these three specific classes, which performs the actual export operation. And then we go back up the chain and we eventually get to export manager file opener. And now we're at the point where, hey, we successfully have a file, we created it and we open that file up. And that is the idea behind this export kind of folder and, and feature and functionality that I've been writing here. And that is pretty much as much as I think I can explain um, without getting too exhausted going through this code base. So I think I'm going to leave it here. This is a difficult video to film because I want to show you guys everything, but I can't, right? And there's a lot of stuff that has kind of prerequisite knowledge you need to understand. And I hope that at least I kind of give you guys some kind of idea of what's going on here and how things kind of work. You don't need to understand all the specific code, but now maybe you understand the complexity in a large scale software system. There's so much stuff happening and just even finding a way to communicate between different processes that are running is difficult in its own, right? And you even saw there's some messy code here because when you don't do something right the first time or you do it not 100% correct, uh, you fall into the trap of just continuing to do it that way until you get to a point where you have these massive files with a ton of stuff going on and it's too late to even change anything. So with that being said, I think I'm going to end the video here. If you guys made it to the end, give yourself a pat on the back. I'm sure not many people will make it this far. And remember, there is that big course discount happening right now for one week. So June 22nd to June 26th. Again, more information about that in the description. So if you enjoyed, make sure you leave a like, subscribe, and I will see you guys in another YouTube video.